five, four, three, two, one. Hello everybody, I'm Dear Myrtle, your friend in genealogy, and welcome to Wacky Wednesday. We're going to be talking with Laura Hedgecock, the author of Memories of Me, and we're going to talk about sharing family stories. And the really wacky thing is that I will be appearing here because I want to hear from this wonderful gal who I met at dinner one of the evenings during Roots Tech. So Cousin Russ, uh, you were also at that dinner party. There were about 10 of us around this big huge table yep. and uh, and you've spent some time working with Laura so she's very familiar with Google Hangouts thanks for helping her with that it was a pleasure that's so cool and then Laura welcome to Wacky Wednesday thank you I'm happy to be here well I want to first of all show folks uh, your um, your book on Amazon.com so we'll get that link shared out in the community right off the bat let me share my screen and cousin Russ will share the link uh, and uh, when you're looking at it this is the Kindle version that I'm looking at it's also available in paperback isn't it yes the, and it looks exactly the same uh, the mm -hmm. subtitle is a little hard to see in the screen it's a complete guide to telling and sharing the stories of your life well good and we're also going to talk about your grandmother and her legacy of stories to you but folks what you'll find here underneath that wonderful big view of the cover of her book um, is the table of contents including things like outlining that's something I didn't learn till I was a junior or in high school believe it or not another link that I want to share with you is um, Laura's website which is treasure treasure chest of memories dot com this is her blog and um, and cousin Russ I'm sure you love this blog post it has a lighthouse in it I did <laughs> Okay, Laura, uh, talk to us about your grandmother's gift to you. Uh, well, you actually had two very different grandmas, so give us a scoop, kiddo. Okay, well, my my maternal grandmother was kind of, was the inspiration for the book. Mm -hmm. She wrote in secret all through her life. She wrote down her stories, memories, descriptions of ancestors, family lore, things that have been passed down. She described life, life on the farm. She even had a few good recipes thrown in. Aha. And then shortly before she lost her battle with breast cancer, hmm. she passed it on. And my mother deciphered it. I'm going to say that because her handwriting was really, really hard to read. Cryptic. And, <laughs> yes. And so she, my mom, typed it all up and so every child and grandchild got their own copy and my grandma called this collection of memories her treasure chest of memories oh and that's why you have treasure chest of memories dot com because that's to honor this grandmother right now you have another grandmother who was not quite so forthcoming tell us about that well she always told us that um, her mother died when she was six and that her father elected not to raise her. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't until 2006, so this was after she was gone and both my parents were gone, mm -hmm. that I have an aunt who is a genealogist mm -hmm. and she said she found a census record for my grandmother along with her father and her stepmother. Ah. And I didn't see how that could be. So, of course, I ran up to the library, and I pulled up the image on Ancestry, mm -hmm. and my Aunt Anne, as normal, was correct, and there was my grandmother at age 15, <laughs> living with her father and stepmother. She uh, used to tell us she could barely remember her father's surname. So uh, a little, little more research revealed that she had 11 siblings. Oh, my heavens. She raised my father as an only child. So can you imagine how many cousins he would have had out of 11 siblings? Wow. That is incredible. He would have had so many cousins to communicate with. She just, um, I don't know why things like that happen in our family history. So 
I want to explain something to our viewers uh, and those of you who are uh, in the community right now watching this live or who will watch this later. We met Laura at Roots Tech and Laura, your, your premise is to teach us how to share our memories. You'd still trust this other person in your family to be the genealogy nut. But you are the keeper of the stories, and we just, I wish I had something like this uh, in my family that I had inherited. Actually, I had to decipher my dad's cryptic, cryptic handwriting, uh, but it was just a few short pages, not an entire lifetime of memories. Cousin Russ, did you inherit anything like Laura did? I I have I have photos and I have uh, logs of trips that my parents uh, took over the years that they would camp. Aha! So that's an interesting thing. I knew about the photos. So Laura, tell us a little bit about your book, Memories of Me. Now, are these your memories or your grandmother's memories that we're talking about in this book? Neither. It's really more about how to do it how to put together your own treasure oh. chest of memories. Okay. Perfect. And, and so there are examples of my writing, but it's just to be a sample of a, of a way to do things. Mm -hmm. And the purpose of the book is to kind of break down all the roadblocks that stop people from writing down their stories and sharing mm -hmm. their stories. Mm -hmm. So there's topics, and each topic is followed by some brainstorming sheets and mm -hmm. a sample. Mm -hmm. And there are some sections on better writing, but it's more to help people avoid some big pitfalls than it is a book about writing well. It's really not a book about writing. It's just how to get going and how to make it your own. There's not a right path or a wrong path. Mm -hmm. It's just a guide to help you along the way on your journey of, of writing down your stories and sharing them with your loved ones. Well, uh, uh, you know, part of the reason why I wanted you to come and talk with us about your book and some uh, one or two good ideas from your book um, is that we're we are coming up on a new writing series that has to do with writing proof arguments when you have to take multiple documents and try to prove whether or not the uh, the woman did have a stepmother or not you know is there truth to the family story or where no single document lists who the parents are and that's what you're trying to prove and that kind of persuasive writing is a completely j different genre you want us to open our minds and not be blocked by the writing itself so that we can get the memory out and share it with our our cousins our siblings our children our grandchildren am I, am I getting that right right even your future even your future loved ones that you don't even know yet mm -hmm. because um, to me that is the true view that is the reason our memories are such a treasure mm -hmm. is we're not always going to be there to kiss boo-boos and bandage knees mm -hmm. but through our stories we can Wow, and through our stories, we can provide a sense of uh, of love and um, support, yeah, and a little bit of a uh, sense of humor coming through. And I can see that. I can't yeah. exactly. I could give my recipe for purple ice cream, <laughs> but uh, but I can't That's actually good. <laughs> Okay, there's a backstory to that one. <laughs> yeah, one of the things I really find very important about my grandmother's collection is I knew my grandmother as a little girl knows a grandmother. She was the woman that made fried chicken. Mm -hmm. She showed us where the kittens hid under the bill, you know, in the barn. Mm -hmm. But now, as I'm older, through stages of my life, I now have a woman-to-woman -woman relationship with her. Hmm. I've read how she felt watching her children grow. I can relate to that as a mother. Mm -hmm. I've read how she felt the day my grandpa died. Mm -hmm. I've read how she still mourns a stillborn baby that when she was in her 70s. Mm -hmm. So I have a different relationship than I ever could have had in life. Because she put her feelings down on paper. Now, did, what, what form what, were... Were these loose papers or notebooks or what? 
it was a spiral notebook. Wow. Um, my kids would be lucky if they get it off my blog. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah. a couple of snippets of things that I've collected over the years, funny little sayings or little, remember when we used to take a newspaper <laughs> and always read the funny pages first? And sometimes, always. yeah, sometimes that or a Dear Abby would like r resonate with me and I clip it and I have it in this folder still, even though I'm pretty high tech. And, uh, but I don't have it in one place yet. So how what, how am I going to get started? What I mean, what would you suggest I do? Well, there's a couple of different theories you could if if you want to record just your own stories. Mm -hmm. The easiest place to start is the things that you would tell at every family reunion anyway. Mm -hmm. It's the stories that we all know and they come really easily. And I usually suggest starting at a point like that just because you're not likely to get bogged down you can just quickly get those stories out. It's, it's like no stress because you're already used to doing that and yes so then we're in the habit of starting to write. Right and I definitely think you should do it piecemeal. I think people put it off because they think oh one day I'll write my family history and that's just such a huge intimidating task whereas if they just think this week I'm gonna write down about grandpa and the snake Ah. That's a doable thing. So it's like one anecdote, sort of. Right, and they don't have to be long. Okay, so it could just be a paragraph or two or three um, with a picture of a copperhead or something like that on right. the side. Okay. Um, Cousin Russ, let's ask the people in the community um, to give some <clears throat> feedback to Laura. Has anyone in the community already written down their stories that are part of their personal treasure chest of memories? Or are they thinking about it and are a bit concerned? Well, you you have done that, haven't you? You, uh, you and Carrie, where you did some short subject videos, and now Carrie, your daughter, has done some short subject videos based on that scanning project that you did. So, is is that what you're talking about, Laura? The short subject technology. You know, we have YouTube that we can do these short subject videos uh, and get them recorded. Yes, I'm a believer in using whatever technology you're comfortable with. Mm -hmm. So if it's a pen and a spiral notebook, that's fine. If it's YouTube videos, that's fine. If it's your blog, it's, that's fine. Even as we saw at Roots Tech, the story worth idea. Just yep. getting people to verbally record their stories. The thing that I liked about story worth was what I heard it was very low tech. But I forgot about very low tech because I don't have a physical phone in my home. I have a cell phone. Mm -hmm. But my aunt has that phone that I could set it up ahead of time and have a conversation with her over the phone and get it recorded. Um, Laura, let's talk about that concept with the folks out there who are considering writing Episode by episode. Um, okay, Lisa's got something. For Lisa us. says I have I've done a bit of the book of me. Okay, so the book of me is a um, a weekly blogging prompt in the genealogy community, Laura, that you may be unaware of, and it's good to hear somebody's doing that. I know many people are doing it, and that same concept of one story at a time, one episode at a time. Mm -hmm. uh, what did you write about first when you started? What was what was the easiest to write about? And you don't have to give away all your family secrets. <laughs> no, I think writing about my grandparents was what was easiest for me. I had, um, I think I took a little bit of time to get to the point where I could open up about my own feelings and my own past. Mm -hmm. So it was easier to start describing other people. Mm -hmm. So they were, it was yes, they were very personal to you because they were your grandparents, but there was some distance there so that it wasn't so challenging to then start tackling the things in your own life. 
Just yeah. a minute, we have a comment from the community. I have a comment from uh, Doris who says, I have some stories. I'm looking for a perfect way to record them. Mm -hmm. I, I, does it have to be perfect? <laughs> oh, that is such a good question. Oh, no. <laughs> no. Uh, we'll bring another one, then you uh, okay. can come back. It's, uh, this is from Molly. My mother left several logs of trips and family events, also journals. I haven't uh, really started to writing many of them yet, and I'm in the same position that you are. <laughs> Well, okay, so we've got a mix of people that have done a little bit of journaling with that journaling prompt from Book of Me. Some people have inherited things. And so we've got some viewers here who are primed and ready for your message. And I like your first concept, which was start with the easiest stories to tell, the normal ones you tell at family reunions, and then then kind of spread out from there. Um, and maybe you're you're much younger than I am, Laura. You're at a different stage in your life. <laughs> and so I started thinking I need to start telling my story and my recollections. Well, that's my other favorite place to start, especially for family historians, is mm -hmm. start with what you're afraid you're going to lose, which means go out and interview older family members, hear their stories, and ask them questions. Well, I am the older family member, except for my Uncle Jack, who's still not dead, guys. <laughs> but I hear what you're saying. You're absolutely right. Uh, I was working with so, some 20 youth in our home last evening from our local church group. And uh, I spoke to them about, you know, I know your grandmother. She lives in your house. I'd like you to get three stories from her this next week just to get the conversation going. It's all good. Beautiful. Yeah, that's wonderful. Yes. Okay, so what about finding time to write? Yeah, I think you have to not bite off more than you can, you're going to realistically chew. Mm -hmm. And that's part of the point in doing it piecemeal. But on the other hand, if it is something that you think is important, I obviously think it is, <laughs> you do have to go ahead and make the time. That, you know, set yourself some goals and then reward yourself for meeting them. In fact, I have a whole chapter about that in the book, but that's one of the things. When you, when you do it, celebrate it in some way. Share it with other people. Have a nice piece of chocolate. Yeah, I was wondering if chocolate was involved. <laughs> <laughs> so I, here's how I would interpret that about the time. Mr. Bird and I use a little cozy app on our computer that brings in our Google calendars and then we can add additional like doctor's appointments. If I were to write regularly on this in this capacity, I would want to put it as an appointment for 15 or 20 minutes every week. Yeah, and, and the, uh, then the advantage of that is you would put it at a time that would generally work well for you so you mm -hmm. wouldn't put it at Wednesday nights at 9 because you're just finishing up with this and you probably wouldn't get around to that. I'd be too tired or right. yeah I'm on another subject matter etc. So yes I could work around I mean it's and I'd like to keep it fairly etched in stone so that I didn't make um, you know like a doctor's appointment at the same time. I would mm -hmm. just know that Tuesday afternoons um, I want to write. What have you got from the community? We are getting lots of feedback. This is cool. Laura says hello from Australia. Uh, cool. Grandfather and company had a Saturday night storytelling. Uh, ghost stories, family stories, wishing I could remember them. Oh. Wow. Well, that's that's like what we do on Saturday night and who's in my line. Yes. I, I just say that that's just another way to do it. Uh, you know, who's gonna, who knows who's going to come across on our YouTube videos about the story that we've told about one of our ancestors. Laura, right. I have a feeling that our gal from Australia, if she sets a time to write and starts describing her grandfather and thinking about him, that some of those stories are going to come back from the deep, dark recesses of her mind. 
uh, yeah. particularly if she asks other people who may have been there uh, that are still living, they may be able to help too. Yeah, I like to say storytelling is contagious, but it's really almost more of a brainstorming process. Is once you start down that road of reminiscing, you'll mm -hmm. remember one thing and that will remember another, help you remember another. And like you said, asking other people and believe it or not, surrounding yourself in a sensory way with the thing, like if it was old campfire memories, mm -hmm. if she were to go somewhere where there was a campfire, she might suddenly remember something she hadn't remembered before because oh. that's the way our memories are stored. They're, they're, our memories are stored in our brains in more than just a thought. It can be those other sensory um, right. perception things that kick in. Oh, and especially if they have an emotional connotation, they're stored in different areas too. They're, they're stored in the limbic areas of our brain as well as the cerebral cortex. Okay. Or if somebody's cooking something on the stove that was a recipe from somebody, mm -hmm. oh, those those memories come back. Uh, yeah. for, for me, it would be when I have to do things that are hard and I need to have courage, I spritz white shoulders perfume because that's what my grandmother Frances wore and that you know makes me think of her and then I am you know I feel like she's right there I mean if I'm gonna have a guardian angel it's probably her or grandma Myrtle <laughs> you know but then I can do that brave thing because I'm like bringing back my recollections of who she was and and then I, in this case, I would be able to tell her story better. So Mr. Mert will know if suddenly uh, from my computer room is wafting the fragrance of white shoulders perfume, he'll know, don't interrupt. Her brain's trying to kick in gear. <laughs> That's amazing. Yeah. I, I had a question for you, Laura. Uh, do you have any siblings or cousins that you talk with? I have a sister who's two years older than me. I talk to her all the time and then we have all our other, all my mother's other siblings had bunches of kids. So we have a whole bunch of cousins that we're still what, pretty uh, close to. What I found interesting with one, the last time that my dad's sibling, uh, siblings and cousins got together, they would tell a story and around the room, then there was like six or seven of them. Each of them would tell a di have a different memory of that story. Oh, so yeah. capture them all because there may be a real story there someplace. No, we're not going to get my brother Mike's take on it. <laughs> he always teases me because I'm older, and he tells the story his way. It has no bearing in reality, no basis in fact. You know, but that kind of is a segue into some of what you're going to be doing with the proofs because I recently found out one of the most common stories I heard growing up was about my Uncle Joe and a turkey that was falsely imprinted on him. And this turkey supposedly followed my Uncle Joe all around the farm. So about, I don't know, six months ago, my Uncle Joe told me he never had a turkey. And okay. It, it, it blew my world away. And I don't know why my mom was so convinced that Uncle Joe had a turkey that followed. I don't know which one of them is wrong. But you do have <laughs> family stories, and they don't always agree. But they're both in some way the truth. I mean, the fact that Uncle Joe had a turkey that followed him around was my mom's truth. Mm -hmm. It's my... there, was, there was never a turkey following him around. <laughs> but they're both part of the family story. Uh, yes. And um, I think a very good argument for actually writing our memories down and publishing them is that I will have the last word because my brother Mike isn't writing him down. <laughs> he probably doesn't have a blog. <laughs> no, he doesn't. <laughs> okay, Brad. I, I, I have a comment from Linda. Brainstorming is so good. The memories cascade in amazing ways. The smells, the sounds. Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. And Molly says, Daddy's love for banana bread toasted and covered in butter. Ooh. I used to make it for uh, him a whole loaf and it would last about three days. Wow. Wow. 
That's cool memories. Memory. Now, now, Molly, you've got to write that up and include the recipe uh, and um, a picture of your daddy. Um, I we always called my dad Father Dad, um, and part of it was because our parents were divorced, and so we had a stepfather, and we called him Father Dick, which didn't mean he was a parish priest or anything. We just uh, were making that distinction among us. But uh, but did you notice how Molly referred to her dad as Daddy? That is a sweet term of endearment. So Molly, you have an assignment when you're not doing Gen Law Study Group and beginning genealogy study group. <laughs> assignment. Write a blog. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So I, Lori, oh, you had a question. Rest? Yeah, I had a, I had a question. I uh, when I read your blog, uh, spent a couple minutes reading, and your blog post that uh, of your uh, story at Roots Tech, you you started out by talking about who inspires you, which was the question that we were asked at the beginning. But down in the that blog post, you had a gem that our uh, as we do our research, your aunt Anne had a story for us, and I'll ask you. To, I think you might want to tell it because when we do our research, we teach people to look up and down the census record to see who might be the neighbors are. Does your aunt Anne have a story about that? <laughs> what my story, actually my aunt Anne died about two years ago, but oh. mm -hmm. so, but yeah, she was so, well, first I should preface it with my mother's family, they, they landed in Virginia in the 1600s hundreds and they didn't leave. Mm. So she has, she's not looking at ancestors that are all over the place, but she knew Lunenburg County so well that if she saw a census record with any name, she would know who the neighbors were, what their role was in the community, where, what their kids did, who their kids married. She knew all the interconnectedness in every single census sheet. If you had a question, she couldn't, she wouldn't just answer about the person. She knew everyone and where they lived and how far that was and wow. what church they went to and who married them. Cool. She was a great source of information. So she was the family genealogist. Have any of her kids or any have anybody else in the family taken up that cause? Well, my other, I have an aunt, she's also by marriage, who mm -hmm. who likes it. And I'm hopefully we'll get her to go to Roots Tech with me next year. Ah. But my aunt Anne has a granddaughter who's about 12, who is very interested. Ah. So we're hoping that the granddaughter will be the one that carries her grandmother's passion oh. forward into the next generation. That's so awesome. So I have a question for you um, uh, off the subject of writing. How did you hear about Roots Tech and what prompted you to go? I heard about Roots Tech last year because of the storytelling element. Mm -hmm. I just um, love the fact that genealogy is embracing storytelling that it's not just about facts and sources, mm -hmm. that it's about recording who these people were, what their circumstances were, what made them tick, what their personalities. So that really was the first thing that made me want to go to a genealogy conference. Mm -hmm. So I didn't go get to go last year, but this year I was able to, and I was able to be a speaker. So I just... So um, you were invited to dinner, um, and I went to that dinner because I know Martha of Maya's Books. Yes. Com, and it, is she your publisher, or tell me? No, she's the vendor that's that was carrying my books. Okay. And I had not met her, and she embraced me like an old friend, and was wonderful. Yes, she's absolutely wonderful, and. She invited me to come to dinner mm -hmm. with the okay. other vendors, and that was really nice. Well, and and you get the fact that uh, <laughs> when we go to dinner afterwards, uh, it's totally a chilled out time. People relax. We're not necessarily talking business, although sometimes that subject of genealogy or books, etc., comes up. Um, and um, and that's how you and I met. And you talked to me 
twice while there was a lot of talking going on at that table. And it was finally during that our second conversation that I realized how valuable your insights would be to members of our uh, genealogy community to help us start thinking of that other side of our family history, the, of actually identifying what Michael Haight re, does not like to be called, putting flesh on the bones. He made a, a Facebook post that that's his least favorite cliche in the world of genealogy. But it just means putting the, the stories with the people and the context of history and the place that they lived, um, etc. And that's important because uh, life was completely different for my grandmother as it was for her grandmother. Uh, the life experiences just from the kitchen uh, food preparation point of view, even though it was the United States. It's, we're not talking foreign countries like somebody who has Chinese or Japanese ancestry where there's a big cultural shift. We're just talking about the typical family in the United States and what happened over those multiple generation jumps. Um, so let's get back a little bit to um, um, uh, getting going on our writing. We, you talked about starting with the easy stories and, and maybe even starting with the stories of the older people in our family. Uh, because they're somewhat removed from our personal experience and that that might kind of prime the pump, get us in the writing mode and and we know ultimately we do need to write our own story, our own personal stories and recollections. Yeah. Um, so one, one, thing we... that, one thing that I think is important, although we all want to write as well as we can, we all want to make a good first impression. Mm -hmm. We have to remember, though, that we're not writing for a Pulitzer Prize, and we're writing for a family that already are invested in us and are already invested in our stories. Mm -hmm. So sometimes we set that bar artificially high, and what we really need to be doing is just being ourselves, right? Like we would tell a story to our old friend, let our personality shine. Mm -hmm. I have a one of the analogies I like to make is I like to say that it's kind of like reading the Bible in church because people have come to hear the story. But mm -hmm. I kind of I pulled that out because my son once had to read the Bible and he got really nervous and he read it at rap speed. He read it like, <laughs> <laughs> the king of the God is like the man of the soil and it. And we barely caught on that there was some kind of seed and soil involved. Yes. But afterwards, people came up to him and thanked him for coming, thanked him for reading, told him he should be proud of himself. Wow. And so I think that's why the analogy works is people, our loved ones love us, so they want to hear our stories, and they're not going to be critiquing our delivery. Yes, yes. Well, that is a key point. <laughs> yeah, that is a key point. Let me share a story um, along the same line. Years ago, I was teaching a beginning genealogy class in Florida, and a woman had registered, and her husband came along kind of begrudgingly. And so he, yeah, he was going to take this course with her. And you could tell that he was, uh, well, I, you know, he just wasn't really into this. So in Florida, they have, these people are snowbirds, and they go north for the summer months and come back down to Florida for the winter months. So he went through the 10 weeks of the course and then was gone all summer long. When he came back in the fall, he handed me two big notebooks and said he wanted me to create a book for him out of his compiled family history. So first of all, I was shocked. He got all these birth records and death records and things. And then he, and and, and I complimented him on that. And a couple of the pages, about 10 or 15 of the pages, were printed on yellow paper. And so I asked him about it. Yellow was his mother's favorite color. Then when I looked at the pages, he had told the story in his own hand. Uh, well, it wasn't handwriting. It was a nine-pin printer. It was that long ago. He had told the story about his mother who had died when he was in his late teens and how when it would be a snowstorm or, um, 
uh, certainly not 100 inches like Boston, she would take the family car out and let them tie ropes to the back of the car and she'd slowly guide them through the neighborhood and let them kind of slide around on their shoes behind the car. And then he told what it was like because she had to give herself shots because of her, uh, she had, uh, she was insulin dependent. She had um, diabetes. And I read these stories overnight and was just um, in tears. So when I saw him that next week, um, well, I didn't even wait till the next week. I can remember looking up in the class list, what's his telephone number so I could call him and I'm like, this is the genealogy of your family. This is the heritage that you have. And we will print these pages in yellow when we finally, in these days, you had to do typesetting and paste things up. And it was, but, but the way that he could just pull out those recollections, I was right there, the excitement of it with, you know, worried that if she took the corner too fast, that I would whip around the corner on this icy road too fast and maybe fall into a snowdrift. I could just see it and feel it. I could feel the cold and I could feel how he felt um, as, she, as he saw her getting progressively less benefit from um, uh, the insulin shots because they didn't know that much about um, the profile of a diabetic and how to test it. They didn't have testing kits like we have now. Uh, and, and so, I, and he's like, but that isn't good enough to be in the book. And I said, the book is not just names and dates. You've got to get this story in. And he said to me, okay, like that. And then I said, we also have to tell the story of your father. He was very mean and he was an alcoholic. And he said, well, we could tone that down a little bit. And I'm like, if you want to, you may, <laughs> you know, because he used some expletives. <laughs> <laughs> but it would have been fine if he had the expletives in there. It was what he preferred. But it took a little convincing that those stories were important. Russ, you have something before we switch over to Laura again. Yeah, uh, Doris says, smells trigger memories. Mm -hmm. And Laura from Australia says, I call my parents uh, daddy and mommy, though I am 57 tomorrow. Happy, Happy birthday. birthday. And my parents called their in-laws auntie and uncle, and I call my elders uncle and aunt. And in those days, up to three families uh, will live in one house because pa, mom's dad used to ask people to come and stay with them. Well, and I think, too, in those days, um, you're talking about the impact of the worldwide Great Depression. Um, uh, we had things, we had that here. They had it in England. Um, it was a worldwide depression. Here in the United States, we had a thing called the Dust Bowl, where uh, people were out of work and farmers were not able to produce because they had taken the soil. I guess they figured out it had to do with um, taking the soil and uh, there was nothing to hold the crops, uh, to hold the soil in place. So when the dust storms that usually came, came as usual. How's that? Forget my writing abilities. <laughs> anyway, um, it, it just blew away the topsoil and nothing could grow. All right, let me get Laura in on this. Uh, can you imagine how precious it was for this real tough guy who only came into that genealogy class because his wife twisted his arm, but yet he was so dear to print the pages about her in yellow. Yeah. I still cry to think about it. It is so sweet. And it's also very interesting. He's probably not unusual in that there are sometimes hard decisions to make about what you do want to share mm -hmm. and whether you want to wear rose-colored glasses or not. Mm -hmm. My grandmother definitely wore rose-colored glasses or wrote through rose-colored glasses. Mm. But that might not be the choice everyone makes. Mm -hmm. My grandmother actually, um, she had a great insight into the different families and relatives in, the, in her family because when she was about eighth grade, her father and stepmother took her to see her grandparents for a two-week vacation, but they never came back. Wow. So. Wow. She was 
raised in whoever's household had an extra bed, extra food. They were all very poor. And so she could have been very bitter. But through this, she got to know all her relatives. Mm -hmm. And she has these really nice descriptions of them all. But she never really, very seldom would she do anything beyond hint at anything that wasn't positive about anyone. Now, you're being able to relate that part of your grandmother's experience, you know, correlate the difference between what her childhood experience was and what she chose to write about as an adult. That tells you something about courage and about having faith. It's, it's kind of like, uh, for lack of a better comparison, the diary of Anne Frank. Look at that kind of optimism mm -hmm. in the face of horrible odds. Right. And and um, so how inspiring to know that in your family, Laura, that's the kind of blood you've got coursing through your veins. I don't know how much DNA you got from her, but you are her granddaughter. And you have that same courage. What have you got, Russ? Oh, we can't hear Cousin Russ. Uh, oh, there he is. My parents uh, have great, shared great stories of the Dust Bowl days. And Dora says, Davidson's boat yard is being demolished this summer to make room for condos. My grandfather built that boat yard oh. with his bare hands in the 1930s. Our siblings and cousins are sharing memories of, about it. Now, get it written down, Doris. Get your blog going. <laughs> we'll help you. Wow. Uh -huh. um, Laura, it's kind of fun to see how this works in a Hangout, where Cousin Russ is very good at bringing in <sighs> comments so that they're part of this conversation. Uh, he's yes. got one more comment, and then we'll come back to you. Yeah, Laura, Laura from Down Under says, Love my Nana's cooking rice and curry here in Australia where I was born. There would be up to 20 people for meals at any time. Yum. And I bet you there were stories going around that table. Oh, yeah. I bet so. That's true. Okay, I've got the camera back on you, Laura. Um, so... When your cousins received a copy of this write-up that where your mother had trans more than transcribed, she had to actually decipher the handwriting, um, was there a lot of discussion or did most people put it on the shelf? How was it received? Um, well, because she mailed it to the different cousins, I'm not really sure. I think most of us appreciated it more as we got older. My grandmother died when I was about 21, mm -hmm. and probably it was when I was getting closer to 30 that I really wanted to delve back into it. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, then after my parents were killed in a car accident, mm -hmm. I valued her stories even more. Oh. It was a connection somehow that she, you know, especially writing about watching my mother grow up, uh -huh. it provided me. And I think, too... As my cousins have all gotten older, they, they're the same way. They go back. So when I wrote to all of them and said, I want to write this book, and we tell, told Grandma we wouldn't publish her personal stories. To the but world. Said, Just keep it among yourselves. Exactly. Yeah. But I said, we can publish her passion. We can share her passion of connecting through narratives. Mm -hmm. They were all on board. Mm -hmm. Very so, cool. Yeah. Very cool. So um, we were talking about um, that concept of a family narrative in our email before we um, uh, before the hangout, and you wanted to give us some ideas. You've mentioned how your connection to your grandmother's writing helped you after the loss of your parents. It gave you a sense of belonging. Dare I say? Yes and connectedness and that there's it's hard um, um, anything else to share along that line about how family narratives do help us um, connect with ancestry well they definitely and she definitely helps me connect with her because her grandparents are my ancestors mm-hmm 
So what would just be a name on a pedigree chart with some dates mm -hmm. is a loving grandfather that, you know, as he walked with her through the fields and was planting, talked to her about his faith. And oh. the clock that I have on my fireplace, I know that it was in his house, and she has no idea where it came from, and that sometimes it sped the time away too fast when people were having too much fun. <laughs> That's and, funny. And then when you're wading through a painful thing, the clock ticks so slowly. Oh. It doesn't tick at all now, but oh. it did. But yes, that's a very deep connection to these people yes. that were, by a lot of standards, not outstanding. Just regular they're, folks. They're just regular folk, but to me, that gives me a great sense of connection to my heritage and to my family and to connect me with my cousins. That's where we all came from. Yeah. So let's look at this. We've got Laura, the author. We've got her parents. We've got the grandmother, and, well, both sets of grandmothers, one of whom uh, fibbed a little bit. <laughs> and then we have the parents of the grandmother who left her uh, <laughs> for what was supposed to only be a two-week vacation. And then we have the grandparents who raised your grandmother. So that we're talking five generations back that your grandmother is referring to this grandfather walking through the fields, planting seeds, and talking to her. That's a that's quite a rich heritage to have insight into who it, who are your great great grandparents. Right. The ones that, just the great grandparents weren't that great. <laughs> they, they well, one died mama. in childbirth, so it was the step grandmother who was who her her stepmother was the one that was bad. Her, uh, her yeah. natural her biological mother died in childbirth. So, you know, there's more and more to the story the more we talk about this sort of thing. Now, you know, I once made the mistake of saying the evil stepmother story. Um, <laughs> yeah. Because I have that in my family. Uh, my grandmother uh, on my mother's side did not like her stepmother. And uh, I was always told that she, that her mother died young. Uh, when my grandmother was quite young. Well, no, she was uh, at the time period, uh, I don't have her graduation from high school, but was in that time period between when she graduated from high school and when she went for, went to college and took some stenography courses. So it wasn't, a, it was more like a trade school thing. And I think it's hard for any child to deal with um, a mother figure in the absence of their loved, beloved mother, but um, I had to I had to step back from that term of the evil stepmother because a lot of us have been stepmothers, or in in my case, I had a wonderful stepmother um, who was the shining example of womanhood and motherhood and. She was graceful, she, um, and yet had, uh, uh, for a woman of her time period, it was amazing that she had an innate business sense, which continues to benefit those of us who are her children and stepchildren. She thought of us all pretty equally. Uh, so, um, yeah, we have to, there are going to be phrases like stepmother or evil stepmother that take on certain connotations given uh, this book or that that we may compile. Um, I love that it's five generations. And then you have children? I have two boys. One will be 21 on Saturday. And you adopted him when you were six months old, I can tell. Uh, we've got some feedback from the community. Let's see what that's all about. Uh, Stephanie says, after seeing story worthy at Roots Tech, I signed up. The first question went out to my mom. It was for her to write about what she remembered about her mother. She said it was very difficult to write, very emotional for her. 
I'm hoping that she sticks with it. And Molly has a, a story that says, I always thought my great grandfather was a gruff old man until I read his letters he wrote to my mother when she was in Washington, D.C., away from home and lonely. He wrote her almost weekly from the farm in Vermont, and letters were sweet and loving. Wow. Oh, that's so sweet. That is very tender and sweet. So some of the stories that we have to write about are going to be emotional. Um, some of them are going to, we may have to decide to pick and choose our words. Others are going to be very tender, but we don't need to write them in chronological order, do we? No. Not at all. So is it in the compiling of it later that um, that it's a, that we can put them in chronological order or is it okay if we just use a spiral notebook and the story's complete on these two pages like Red Book Magazine? I think you can do what works for you. I mean obviously I love everything my grandmother did and she just wrote one page after another and didn't organize it in any fashion. Mm -hmm. I think how you do it's really going to be part of who you are. You might want to do one side of the family versus the other side of the family. You mm -hmm. might want to have love stories in a separate section. Mm -hmm. You can kind of do it by topics. So I think you do what works for you. Mm -hmm. Okay, Cousin Russ may have some feedback here. Let's see. Linda says, I've written some uh, about memories of others, very rewarding, but writing about my own life and its complications is much harder. The things that keep me at it and honest is the mantra, what do you wish my great-grandmother had written down? Would I care if it's pretty or perfectly written? Nope. I just want to know so that uh, so that I, it's what I try to keep doing. So, so um, maybe you can, I don't know if you can bring that um, share screen back, Cres and Russ. Linda, is that your great-grandmother's picture, your mother's picture, your grandmother's picture that you've selected for your current profile picture here on Google Plus? I'd like to know. And uh, she can get back to us in a minute. Sometimes, Laura, there's about a 10 to 20 second delay uh, between what words we're speaking and what shows up for the people who are viewing. And we are continuing to add people to our viewership during this live broadcast of Wacky Wednesday. And folks, just let me do a share screen for a little bit to remind you who we're talking with. Um, this is Laura's book. Uh, it's here at Amazon.com, and if you uh, go scroll back among the comments, Cousin Russ has given you the link to this. This is the Kindle book version that I'm looking at. Beautiful cover design, very nice cover design. And Laura is our author here, and she's giving us advice on how to share the stories of our life as well as those of our uh, ancestors as we remember them. Um, you know, uh, my father should have paid me extra money so I would tell his story well. <laughs> I don't know. We're also taking a peek again at treasure, uh, treasure chest of memories.com. I wanted to get all the right amount of S's, so it's treasure chest of memories. Dot com. You have a blog. There's more information about the book with some excerpts uh, and uh, resources for family history, writing resources, scrapbooking resources, and something about uh, Roots Tech 2015. So uh, you can get to know Laura better uh, by um, following her blog. Uh, you can see too that uh, her website has information so they can follow her here on Twitter, Instagram, all the usual social media um, mechanisms for keeping in touch. All right, now um, she's giving us feedback already. What did she say? That's a great, great maternal, and that's all she said. And then she said, she, uh, and she looks fair amount like me. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Uh, all you need to do is part your hair in the middle, braid it on the sides, and get a, a green checkered, green and white checkered 
uh, house dress, and that would be perfect. You know, talking about this, uh, the thing that I miss most is that I know that my grandfather and his siblings wrote a lot of letters, and I and they have been lost, and it just mm -hmm. breaks my heart because I know the family wrote letters. I have letters from other family members who were on the Oregon Trail. Uh, my great-grandfather wrote letters home to his family during the Civil War, but I have none of my grandfathers, and it, it breaks my heart. And you even know the owners of the house now and have have let I know the owners of the house if they found that cache of letters they would give them to you Russ but it's right yeah, now they but... haven't found any secret little nooks in that grand old house I'm so tickled oh. that you showed me and Mr. Mert that house uh, so when you speak of your grandfather I I know from whence he came and where you lived it um, and, and by the way Laura cousin Russ really is my real cousin we discovered it in a webinar long ago and far away. <laughs> but anyway, now what about kids? I noticed that there's a you know area or section of your book for kids writing their memories. Let's talk about that in the a minute or two before we've got to sign off. Uh, well, one of the easiest things for a mother to do is to write about her children, mm -hmm. and. And they give us like an almost infinite amount of entertaining oh, material. They do. <laughs> Somehow we lose that joie de vivre by the time we're we got through college and are out earning a living. I don't. But know. they like hearing their stories. I mean, my kids will say, "Mom, tell me again. What did I do? Yes. What happened? How?" And they like hearing. They like having that memorialized. Mm-hmm. They do, and it's um, it's uh, it's a funny thing. My father um, would always joke about this that his mother um, had to take umbrage at the fact that her very youngest sibling, uh, Kenny, was only a few years older than her son, my dad, and uh, okay. there was a tale of. Kenny, Uncle Kenny, taking my dad as a young lad out into the chicken coop to, to uh, collect eggs, and he told my father that the very best place to store the eggs would be in his pants pocket, and to put three <laughs> or four in each one, so my dad stuffed them in there, and then like the little kids that in the old family circle um, comic strip where they instead of just taking the straight route home they go up in here and down in the barn and jump into the hayloft from the hayloft and run around and get you know around the horses corral and all that and by the time my dad got to the front porch at um, his grandmother's house um, uh, he was crying because by now all this egg and everything was just dripping in and out and down his pant legs and it was embarrassing and Uncle Kenny was laughing and Uncle Kenny's mother came out and scolded him and Uncle Kenny's older sister my dad's mother came out and scolded him he got he got pulled by his ear that's what they used to do is pull yeah. him by their ear and don't you ever do that again and oh my gosh and dad finally did tell that story I we would ask about it and once grandma had passed away that there was nobody telling it but in dad's write-up he did tell the story and exactly how he felt about it oh, cousin Russ Lisa said my nana and mother uh, wrote to each other for years after my mother died. I searched for the letters, and I guess my mother had tossed them. I wish I had them. Whoa. Oh, heartbreaking. Heartbreaking. So we have just a, a minute or so. So basically, you want us to just start easy? Yeah. Yes. Well, just start. That's the main thing. But yes. Start. <laughs> start. start. Whatever, however it works for you to start, do it piecemeal. And just, I love what Linda said. Think about what you wish other people had written for you. And just write it down or record it on an audio recorder. Use your smartphone to tell stories. Just share them. I love and, and, it. And it doesn't have to be perfect. That's my takeaway. It doesn't have to be perfect. No, perfection's boring. 
<laughs> yeah, tell my eighth grade grammar teacher that. Uh, yeah, she's always sitting on my shoulder, and that prevents me from getting the story out. I need to be able to just tell the story like I'm talking to you, Laura, which has been yes. very, uh, can you believe this hour has gone by so quickly? No, it's gone very quickly. So, folks, if you would like to get some more advice on how to write your story, the stories of me, uh, get Laura's book, um, Memories of Me, and then what's the subtitle? The Complete Guide to Telling and Sharing the Stories of Your Life. Okay, and my life included rich experiences with my grandparents and my parents, so it's all good. Anyway, so it has been kind of fun to be here for Wacky Wednesday. You all know that usually my very distant cousins take over, and I can't even get in my computer room, and they make disparaging remarks about me from time to time. <laughs> now I know what fun you guys have focusing on one topic on Wednesday evenings here in the United States. And thank you to our worldwide audience. Thank you to our friends in Australia for joining us this evening. Thank you to Cousin Russ for um, weaving your comments in. That really provided a richness to our conversation. And Laura, it was especially good to get to meet you better this evening. Thank you for coming. Oh, thank you. All right. Well, folks, I'm Dear Myrtle, your friend in genealogy. This has been Wacky Wednesday, sharing family stories. Happy family tree climbing, everybody. That's a wrap.